Hello everyone, and welcome back to the Fluctus Channel. In 1956, the Lockheed U-2 Dragon Lady became the first United States aircraft to penetrate Soviet airspace. At the time, the U.S. military believed that Russia had similar radar capabilities to themselves. However, Russian radar was actually far superior, and over 10 days of flights, was eventually able to track the high-altitude spy plane as it photographed Soviet missile installations. This would begin a cat-and-mouse game that would last decades and result in five U-2s being shot down by Russia's allies, the PRC. The U-2 was specifically designed for high-altitude reconnaissance and would go on to become one of the greatest spy planes of all time. Though only 104 of these highly unique aircraft were produced, there are still some flying missions to this day, nearly 70 years later. The Dragon Lady is an extremely unique aircraft with a reputation for being difficult to fly and particularly challenging to land. It also requires pilots to undergo a rather crazy routine before they can be cleared to fly. Once in the air, it can reach altitudes of up to 80,000 feet and travel over 7,000 miles while they gather intelligence and evade enemy radar. While the pilots prepare for their mission, the U-2 undergoes an extensive pre-flight process. One of the first things that set the Dragon Lady apart from other aircraft is its semi-pressurized cabin. Oh, yeah, that's perfect. This is why pilots need to wear special pressurized flight suits that strongly resemble astronaut suits. They also need to undergo a number of special procedures before they can actually get on the plane. To ensure the pilot gets the oxygen they need throughout the flight, O2 is pumped directly into the suit itself. However, even putting the suit on requires assistance from several flight technicians. While cumbersome, the suit is essential to separate the pilot from the extreme elements he or she will encounter at high altitudes. Inside. Preventing a medical emergency is priority number one for the U-2 team. In fact, before the pilot is even cleared to fly, he or she must discuss many personal details with the attending physician. Six, and ear, nose, and throat feeling good. Awesome. This includes what they've eaten the day and the night before. Once prepped, the pilot needs to spend about one hour breathing 100% oxygen under the supervision of medical professionals. And you can breathe. This process is designed to remove nitrogen from the pilot's bloodstream, reducing the chances of the pilot suffering from hypoxia during the flight. Once in this state, it's essential that the pilot be kept on pure oxygen until after they land. This is why the suit is fitted with a portable oxygen supply.
Similar to a suitcase, it allows them to breathe until they can be hooked up to the oxygen supply inside the cockpit. Once the pilot arrives, they are directed into the cockpit, where they are secured in place and hooked up to the local oxygen supply. The pilot must be supplied with special high-calorie beverages with long straws. This allows them to stay hydrated and fed while inside their pressurized suit. Since missions can last up to 12 hours, it's crucial that pilots have everything that they need at their immediate disposal. Once cleared for flight, the pilot will begin taxiing the aircraft onto the runway for takeoff. The U-2 is a challenge to fly for a number of reasons. First, it features an inline bicycle style landing gear that makes controlling the direction of the aircraft difficult. If something were to go wrong, its 50-foot wings could end up making contact with the ground, causing an accident. cockpit is also very tight, and the flight suit greatly reduces the pilot's visibility. This is the main reason why spotter cars are used to provide input to the pilot as they accelerate down the runway. Once the aircraft takes off, however, everything changes. The light weight of the craft, combined with its 17,000 pounds of thrust, propels it upward at a rate of 9,000 feet per minute. With its ability to fly at heights of up to 80,000 feet, Flying the U-2 is about as close as many of these pilots will get to space. The U-2's visibility and stability issues become even more apparent upon landing. Moreover, the lightweight and large wingspan that allow it to fly so effectively are extremely cumbersome. And there are only two sets of wheels to facilitate a safe touchdown. Again, spotter cars are used to direct the pilot, providing information about their position and any potential hazards they might encounter. Due to the large wings, the U-2 can reach very low speeds without stalling, giving the pilot more time. When the aircraft stops, one of its wings will inevitably touch the ground. At this point, ground crews attach temporary wheels called pogos to stabilize the plane as it taxis. In the world of spy planes, no aircraft is more famous than the Lockheed SR-71 Blackbird. Introduced roughly a decade after the U-2, this high-speed reconnaissance craft is extremely different from its subsonic predecessor. The SR-71 still holds the record as the fastest air-breathing manned aircraft 
reaching speeds of up to 2,200 miles per hour. Though it lacked the range of the U-2, it could fly around 5,000 feet higher and use its speed to penetrate deep into enemy airspace. The SR-71 replaced the U-2's 100-foot wingspan with a streamlined 100-foot fuselage and huge turbofan engines. The Blackbird had its first flight on December 22, 1964 in Palmdale, California. During this test, it reached a top speed of Mach 3.4, which exceeded the design team's expectations. Only 32 of these aircraft were ever constructed, and all of those that survived their duties were placed in aerospace museums throughout the 1990s and early 2000s. Despite its age, the plane still holds a number of records, including flying from Los Angeles to Washington, D.C. in just 64 minutes and 20 seconds. The iconic status of the SR-71 makes it a favorite among former pilots and current enlisted personnel alike. In order to preserve these planes for future generations, Retired mechanics and pilots will often get together with airmen to periodically wash the SR-71s that are on display at Air Force bases and museums. The goal is to keep the aircraft looking their best so that their legacy can live on. Though the U-2 and SR-72 came close, they never actually made it to space. However, the Boeing X-37B, which was first tested in the early 2000s, was a new breed of aircraft looking to carry on and expand the spy plane legacy. The X-37 is an orbital test vehicle meaning that it is boosted into space by a rocket and then re-enters the Earth's atmosphere as a hybrid space plane. Engine pump speeds and injector pressures are in family for this thrust level. Thanks to its rocket-assisted nature, the X-37 can reach speeds that even the SR-71 could never imagine. In low Earth orbit, the space plane has been clocked at speeds of over 17,000 miles per hour. This is enough to fly around the Earth once every one and a half hours. Another feature that makes the X-37 stand out is the fact that it is unmanned. It's also extremely small, just 29 feet long and with a wingspan of 14 feet. Though there remains speculation about its purpose, many experts assume the X-37 is intended to be a space-based reconnaissance craft. The X-37 is designed as a fully reusable vehicle. This means that it must not be able to leave space, enter the atmosphere, and land on a traditional runway. in this, it features a variety of fully robotic components, as well as a specialized thermal protection system. Thanks to powerful computers, the X-37 is able to land automatically after returning from orbit, much like the larger space shuttle before it. Though it is still in the testing phase, the X-37 project is sure to help bring the Air Force and its NASA equivalents closer to their goal of developing a fleet of fully remote aircraft capable of space and atmospheric travel.
Truly, these advanced high-speed vehicles could be used for many different purposes, including everything from surveillance to satellite repair. That's the end of this video. I hope you enjoyed it. Make sure to subscribe to this channel so you don't miss any of our new content. See you next time.